Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Nice. Okay, cool. Let's get started. So, um, my name is Simon. Uh, and in this short presentation today, I, I will walk through the possibilities of using data on the graph in a data science context or in a data, data science approach. Um, yeah, so uh, let's just jump into it. So like to just repeat some smart contract basics, I mean, like I probably, you probably are all aware, but um, for, for the mental set, set, I would say like a, a smart contract by itself is, is uh, basically storage um, of, of data, and then you have rules to change that data. But the problem with the storage is that the smart contract, if you query it through JSON RPC, it mostly knows the current state, like the tip of the block. That's the data that you can query. So when you look at the CryptoPunks example, as we see here, then it's easy to query and ask, like, who owns punk number one? But it's a bit uh, it's hard to know who owned punk number one before, and even harder if you want to get try to get to the data like how much was the price and uh, how did the price change over time because that's something that the smart contract by itself does not store it's stored on the blockchain through transactions, but it's not easily retrievable and especially for nfts there comes this idea of provenance so how can we see who owned the, uh, uh, an NFT before, because it's quite important, right? So if, if you see like Vitalik once owned an NFT, then it might be more worth free than when I owned it before, right? Um, so what the graph or like what would be cool is to have something like a time machine. So, so we can travel back in time and look at smart contracts, how their state was like a week ago or a year ago or whatsoever, and get that data in and like, like easily access it. Um, yeah, and so on the blockchain, just as a quick repetition, it's kind of this stored thing. Um, we have the smart contract, as I said, and then when, when we change the state of a smart contract, we send a transaction to the blockchain, and these transactions are stored. And that's how we then later on can retrieve that data. But the whole thing is nice and stuff, but the blockchain was never like directly invented for the data science uh, approaches that we now see uh, nowadays kind of uh, popping up everywhere. Um, it, is in th it is designed for mainly to solve this double spending problem, you know, and that you cannot send uh, one, if you, own ha if you have one ETH, you cannot send it to different people at the same time. So like all that stuff works very well because also we pay the, the validators to, to bring the blocks in with transaction fees, there are block rewards and all that stuff, but that is all kind of designed for the data for actually to read data, uh, to write data onto the blockchain. But if you want to read it out, um, we need to go to this JSON RPC uh, interface, which is a specification that comes from, uh, around 1997 or something like that. That's even pre, it's probably a web one protocol that, that most people interact with the blockchain to, to get data out, which is a little bit strange in my opinion. So how it looks on the blockchain, it is we see this, we see all these different protocols, they all share this one ledger, and all these transactions are just like stacked on top of each other. And if you want to kind of make sense of what's going on in the MakerDAO protocol, then we need to find all these uh, green li lines here in, in, in this stack. So to, in order to make sense of like, hey, how did the TVL actually of MakerDAO uh, develop over time, or which are the walls that are, um, um, maybe in risk of liquidation and so on and and, and that's that 's a little bit the challenge here so when you start to interact with JSON RPC and trying to get that data out by, by yourself, you end up with code like this. Um, what we see here is like in JavaScript world um, really you know d doing hundreds of requests depending on how many like it simp it simply just gets like, "Hey, I want to see all the nfts that one address owns right." But what we do here is like, okay, we, we, get, we get the contract, we, we send the query to the contract, how many are there, and then we loop through that, and for every, for every um, token, then we send another request, and all these requests, they take 200, 300, 400 milliseconds to resolve, and they are, they are sent like a, in um, sequential, so like it can easily get, get, take up to 10 seconds or something like that to just do the simple query of like how many tokens or which tokens does this address actually hold. And that's 
mainly limitation of JSON RPC because it's not built for efficient data extraction. And that's where the graph comes into play, right? It is this API for a vibrant decentralized feature. And on the hosted service, we currently see 1 billion queries per day. Uh, so like it's, it's, very, it's very used by the bigger protocols. Also, um, we, we, we dive later in, deeper into it. It's not only like that the bigger protocols uh, have their own subgraphs that you can use, but there is also, also like very high quality subgraphs, especially built for data science purposes, which we will dive into later. On top of that, the graph is not just a centralized offering. It's not just like a Web2 company that, that a little bit uh, does Web3 Web because it's cool. It's actually a decentralized indexing network protocol. So the idea really here is like that data should be free and data should be in the hands of us all and not like that somewhere like a Google that, that is able to give you access to their blockchain API and then, and then asks money for it, and then you're never really sure if that data that, that, that uh, they provide to you is, is, is right or not. It's really a like the, the goal is really to be a decentralized indexing network protocol, and that's already possible. Like on the decentralized graph network by today, we see uh, more than 800 subgraphs already deployed. 435 indexes worldwide, like these are individual in entities. They are not like, it's, it's a permissionless protocol. Everybody can become an indexer. Um, so that gives a huge redundancy that, that subgraphs are indexed by multiple indexers. And if one goes down and other stays around, um, that also makes it cheap because indexers compete for the best service. And um, the whole mission is really going to this global open API that we can all work together and query together, and the data is here at our fingertips. So that gives us, in the end, truly decentralized data. Now, there is a lot of data science um, stuff around, like more and more, I would say, like we, we, we see that the space, more people see, like it's very interesting to get data from the blockchain and try to do some analysis on it. And uh, for, because also the blockchain by itself is an open, open system, it's, it's very interesting. So we can see trends, we can follow whales, we can start to try to find out like where are these, um, uh, where are these events happening? How can we ad identify and then do we see that it triggers something else? Is there any uh, correlation? Um, so that's very cool. Also, the data availability is high, as I said, because we have this decentralized network. There's always one indexer around. It's, it's transparent, like subgraphs. Most subgraphs are open source, so we can verify um, what they actually do, how they are executed, and um, we can also learn how they are built. But there's also the decentralization aspect that I said. Also, in the graph network, there is a consensus mechanism on data correctness. So indexes talk to each other. And um, that's something also that will, that will come more um, to, to see like, hey, I saw this data. What, did, what data did you see? And then, then we, we know like, OK, this is actually, we can find the truth. And it's using GraphQL. Like GraphQL, in my opinion, is one of the nicest data query languages out there because it's very, de it's very descriptive. You will see later on, I, I show you how we can, we can dive into, and very powerful. And in the end, you get out JSON, which is like a, a uh, very common format of uh, working with data. Um, yeah, so the cool thing also about Gra GraphQL is because it's an open standard, so you can use whatever tool that you want to, to use it. Uh, in the end, it's JSON, so you can use Python, you can use R, you can use Tableau, you can use Retool or whatever data science tool that you need. In the end, you feed in J uh, JSON um, that you can c extract from the graph. So as a da data scientist, um, some tips to how to approach. So first, it's very important to be aware about what do I want? Like, what's my question that I want to be, get answered, right? I mean, it's one thing to play around a little bit and explore the data, but it's always better to start with a clear question. So for example, the one question would be on, on MakerDAO protocol is like, hey, which are the subgraphs, uh, no, which are the subgraphs, which are the walls that are near to liquidation? Or how does the whole value to um, ratio look like, uh, value to borrow ratio look like? 
And if we, ha if we have this, we can start. We can start to explore the data. We can see which data is there, how is it presented, can I make sense out of it? And then we can, we can perform the analysis, get that data actually out, start to play around, get it into our tools, try to, to draw some charts and see if that makes sense. And then we can communicate the results, results or we can reiterate. We can maybe say like, okay, um, that brings me to the idea that we could probably also start to combine it with, with data from Aves, and we can like have a more broad view or some, something like that. So that's so the general steps that I would like to follow doing data science with the graph. Cool. So a quick, quick repetition. So who in the audience knows what a subgraph is? Cool. All right. Um, who wrote already a subgraph? Uh-huh. OK, two, three. All right. Oh, nice. Cool. Nice. Thanks for using the graph. Good choice. Um, yeah, just as a quick repetition, what is a subgraph? So the subgraph is the main building block of, a gra of the graph. Uh, you, can, you can think about it's mainly code, so you, you write code, and one part of the code is a schema. So the schema defines a database, how a database looks like. So you can start to do something like, for NFTs, for example, you do like, ah, oh, okay, I have a token, or I have NFTs, then I have owners, I have transfers, and maybe I have sales, and then you just start and, and, and give for each of these entities uh, fields. So it's really a database schema first. And then second, you have a mapping. A mapping is an instruction set of telling then the graph node uh, how to extract that data from the blockchain. So you say which contracts are I'm interested in, which events on that contract are I'm interested in, what should I do if I find, if I see these events. Um, and then you start, we start to kind of write that code that, that gets the data out of the blockchain and stores it into the database so we later on have it uh, available for quick retrieval. So that's, that's a subgraph. Um, so to come to that image from before, as I said, like on, on the blockchain everything is in th these transactions and th these different protocols share the same data, the ledger, right? Subgraphs basically clean that up. So with subgraphs we will end up eventually with like clear, defined databases or buckets that only focus on that data that is interesting for us. And, um, and then we can later on just uh, query per bucket. So it's really an indexing protocol creates this, this thing. Then we can think of each of these uh, databases as one subgraph. And eventually we end up with a very nice graph called queries like this. So that's th doing the same thing that I showed before but just with GraphQL and with the graph, so it's one query to the decentralized network that gives me like all the NFTs um, with previous owners if I want to, with um, metadata if I want to. So that's, that's really a, a beautiful way of retrieving data. So that ends in this modern depth dep architecture or mo modern data science ar architectures like that we have the user interface or so the consumer part on the top and then uh, in, it still writes to the blockchain directly because that works well, right? But in between for the data retrieval, we have this indexing protocol, which is the graph. So we have this uh, quick uh, possibility to get to data. A graph node looks roughly like this on, on top. Um, we, we send transactions to smart contracts. The smart contracts then emit events. The graph node listens to those events. When they see the events, it goes to the mapping module on the bottom left. Um, and that, that stores it in the database, and then it's stored. And then on the, also on the left side, we see the, the queries go through the GraphQL APIs and then just into the graph node, it retrieves it from the store and sends it back. So that's roughly how this works. Or you can th think of it like this nice little uh, GIF here. So we have like this just mess of, of, of data and like magically the, the graph helps to organize it into these buckets. So uh, if you want, you can tweet about that you have learned about the graph. So marketing told me I should have a slide like this to increase Twitter engagements. Uh, we'll probably re retweet or like. Um, so it's not just like it's a, you know, it's always give and take, network building and stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the tweets. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, let's just do it, right? 
So another QR code, <laughs> if you want to quickly go to that one, uh, that links actually to the slides of this talk. Um, so you could follow that along, maybe later or now, or however it um, yeah, is, is comfortable for you. Um, because like l later there is like a lot of links that made, make sense to do to, to the first steps. Do we all have QR code scanned? Uh, okay. Cool. So I said before, like on subgraphs, um, it's, a, it's a decentralized network, and, and like everybody can uh, publish a subgraph there, and so, so not all have the same quality. Um, also, like a lot of subgraphs are built by the DEP teams, basically to power their front end. But if you really have this data science uh, use cases or requirements, then uh, an another structure would be needed. Um, and that, that's where the Messari subgraphs come into play, actually. They, so Messari joined the graph as a core dev team, I think, last year. They, they got some funding from the graph foundation to really build these high quality subgraphs. And um, their goal is to eventually write 400 subgraphs. As of now, we have like 90 subgraphs are production ready. And the cool thing about it is that their subgraphs are all schema compatible. What does it mean? When we can, uh, let's, let's have a look at them actually. So you can go to the subgraphs.messari.io and uh, we see this, yeah. And then we can scroll through it. So they have categories. So there's a bridge, there are bridges. So we have bridge subgraphs that are tracking all these different bridge protocols. Although most of them are still in development, you see that here. But um, for example, this multi-chain bridge, if you go on the Ethereum subgraph, and open it up. And uh, open the Ethereum, then let's open Phantom. So you can click on, on here, and then you click on that um, header and that opens then the actual subgraph. Now if you look at, at the subgraph um, in, in, in detail in the playground, uh, the, what I do is usually I just go to this GraphQL uh, explorer here, so that it's really helpful. With, with that I can actually really start to explore the data. So let's see. So we see we have accounts, bridge message, cross-chain tokens, and so on and so forth. And when I go to this one, because it is from the same category, it has, a, it has the same like accounts, bridge messaging, tokens. Um, and that's very cool. So I can start to, do, to craft the query. So let's say, I don't know, cross-chain tokens and send it to one subgraph, so it's the multi-chain Ethereum, I can just copy, go over here, paste, and send it again, and the same query works. Now this thing with the standardized schema, it's very powerful. Because we not only have bridges, we also have exchanges. So you can start to, so we can start to write queries against, let's say, I don't know, Honey swap, and then uh, take this exact same query and, and send it to Trader Joe on Avalanche, and uh, so we can start to, to compare them, right? So we, we can see, if, for example, we can compare daily volume or uh, which tokens are the most tr traded or uh, how many, um, what's the TVL, and so on and so forth. And we can just uh, one craft the query and then just send it to every subgraph in the same category. So interesting categories are probably exchanges. You see also here, um, they are already like, a lot of them are already green and in production. Um, then we have ERC721, although it's still in, in the works. We have governance. So for all the people that are interested in DAOs, like there, there is real, we, can, we can really extract good, good uh, stuff from, from the governance. Um, uh, yeah, governance across all these different protocols, the DAOs, how the votings are, the ballots. We can start to look into this. 
Um, there are lending protocols. So again, here is Aave, Maker, Compound, and, and so on. You can also start to compare, compare the key, key metrics there. Different networks, uh, NFT marketplaces is, is on the way. Um, yeah, vaults, etc. So uh, that's very a good, a good thing to start here. Cool. That's what we showed. Yeah, if you want to query a subgraph on the decentralized network, so we can go to the graph.com. We have also the graph explorer. So the one is this Messari thing. Also, it's just the graph explorer. So for example, like I know there is this CryptoPunk subgraph. Here it is. And uh, again, we have the playground. The playground is, we can just play around, right? Again, here we can open the explorer. So let's say, let's look at um, the highest sales, right? First 10, order by amount or by direction descending. So you re we really see thanks to the, um, to the GraphQL interface, we can really start to just explore these different schemas and, and by just clicking around. And let's see, amount, timestamp, the transaction hash. So who of you knows which was the highest punk sale ever happened? Or how much, how much ETH was it? Nobody? Okay. Now we can send it. Like knowledgeable people would probably say it's this one. Uh, I think it's 800 ETH, but there is actually one that was the, even more. I think it's 1200 ETH or something like that. Why? And, but if you go to larvalabs.com website, and then we see like the highest one was actually this one, 8K. So why is this, not, this one not stored? We can also get uh, maybe the ID. Um, no, like NFT ID, we need. Okay, so 9998 was the highest sale, but 5822 is that what you see here on Larva Labs. So, you know, again, Larva Labs website is a centralized website, and what they did actually is they censored the highest tra uh, transaction. Why? Because this person that made, that made that one used the flash loan from Aave to just buy its own punk and send it back in the, in the same transaction um, in order to game, game this, uh, this ranking, right? And then Larva Lab thought like, yeah, I mean, like that's, that's not really the highest sale, right? I mean, this is cheating. But now the question is, is it really cheating? If you really look on the blockchain, this was actually the highest sale. So... Now we have like a very good example how to trust data or when to trust data, right? Cool. I think we are almost at time. Uh, I'll show this QR code again, but we also have like maybe one or two minutes for questions. So um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and then I try to understand you. Uh, hi, uh, GraphQL has a uh, kind of event notification back to uh, back to UI. Let's say, does a graph support that that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there's there's the GraphQL subscription standard that you talk about. Um, it was implemented in the graph node, so it's kind of there, um, but uh, it's 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 deprecated. We we do not officially say you you should use it because you can run into weird problems with it. Um, that being said, there is a new standard coming to GraphQL, uh, which is live queries, which is actually a little bit nicer because you then would just write the query. I mean, it would look something like this. You would just do the, I think, a, you would do something like this at live. Oh, it doesn't work here. But you would just annotate the query as live, and then like whenever the underlying data changes, it, it would be pushed. That's something it's currently worked on. But for now, um, yeah, you, you can, we should use polling for now, or you can tr try this old subscription standard. Yeah. More questions? Yes, yeah, so 
who pays for the queries and what are the tokenomics of you know the tokens that you need for that yeah sorry good question also so that basically you pay per query um and uh, in order to do that, you would need to have uh, an API key. The API key you can simply get uh, on the, when you go to the Supercraft Studio, you connect your wallet. I make it a little bit quick. Um, and then you can just go to API keys, create API key. And then you give in your email, and then you receive 1,000 free queries. And later on, uh, how it works, you need to load GRT on Arbitrum, although you could directly bridge it on, on, on Ethereum to, to load uh, your, um, your API key. So the idea is that so indexers, when we get a little bit into tokenomics, uh, so indexers receive indexing rewards, but also query fees. Um, in order to serve these queries, but it's subject to change. Maybe at some point there will be more query fees and less indexing rewards. So we're really bootstrapping the network right now. Um, it's very early. But for you as a data scientist that want to extract data, go to the graph.com slash studio, log in, and get 1,000 free queries. And then you can already get started. And with that participating, actually, the graph is sponsoring the hackathon on the weekend. And if you use the decentralized network, and um, for your data science stuff, you, you will get uh, points for that. Cool. I think that's it. I go back to this one again as a last time, so you can check it. Otherwise, I will stick around maybe one, five, or 10 minutes here. Um, but also find me later. I will be here like a, a different events, always open for a chat. And uh, thank you so much for your att uh, attention. Thank you.